Hey everybody. We're gonna get started. Why don't you stand? Let's just open in prayer. Everybody doing well? Yes. Yeah. We went from a heat wave to all of a sudden. Yeah, the, the down we needed the rain though, so that's a good thing. Amen. Well, Father, we come to you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior and our Redeemer. Uh, Father, your salvation. We thank you tonight for your mercy and your goodness in all of our lives. And Father, thank you for what you're doing even now in the midst of all the calamities and troubles in the lands. Uh, Father, you keep your people. You're faithful to your word. Uh, we thank you for that. And we thank you that we have a hope in the midst of all of this. And we are blessed. Like the scripture says, we're blessed of the Lord, both great and small. Uh, Father, we may look not important to hardly anyone, but we still have the blessing of God. Yes. And Father, that's the greatest thing we can have. So we thank you tonight. We give you the praise. We ask you to bless the word. And uh, Father, we know the word is power. The word is might. Uh, Father, the word changes us and yes. cleanses us. And we thank you for that. And Lord, thank you for the gathering of the saints together and all the areas where they gather tonight and tomorrow and on the Sabbath. We thank you for all these things and give you the praise and be exalted in all of our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you could have a seat or you could say hello to somebody or whatever the case. We're going to talk a little bit of just about the inheritance again tonight. Uh, we talked about some of that a ways back, and I wanted to go back to Romans chapter 8, if you will. I was going to start tonight with we're having a baby. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, and I'll say why. Uh, because when you're having a baby, you start to prepare for things, right? Yes. I mean, your body even prepares without you doing anything. Isn't that true? Uh, things change, things happen, and so on. You know you're having a baby, and wouldn't it be strange if, I guess it would be you wives, would say you're nine months pregnant now, you're due on, say, uh, July 7th or 8th of this year, and you're nine months or so pregnant, and all of a sudden you start to have some pain, and you start to have some strange feelings. And you look at your husband and say, I don't know what's wrong. I'm having these pains. And he says, well, honey, you're pregnant. You're due in two more weeks. But why am I having these pains? Well, because you're going to have the baby in a couple weeks, and your body's preparing, and everything's setting the stage. And pretty soon, we're going to have the child, and you're going to be relieved, and we're going to be rejoicing. Yeah, but I don't know why I'm having these pains. Well, remember the doctor told you that you will go through this and you might have that. And as you get closer to the baby, you'll have contractions. And as those contractions start, then when you get closer to the baby, you'll have more contractions and stronger contractions. Whew, I'm already sweating. Uh, so you wouldn't do that because you know you're having a baby, right? So why is everybody saying, why are all these things happening? The Lord told, me that, told us there's going to be a birth here, and the earth is travailing in pain because of it. And yet we're always saying, what is going on? What is happening? Why aren't people listening? And why are they doing those things out there? Because there's a birth about to happen, just like he said in the scripture, that the earth will reel to and fro, because it's about to give birth. So when we read in Romans uh, chapter 8 here, it tells us about a covenant, the New Testament. And we're going to start down in about, uh, let's start in verse 16. We could start anywhere around there, but it says in verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. Now, a lot of folks are in the church, but I don't know how many folks can say that I really believe and the Holy Spirit really confirms with me that I am a child of God. 
we would hope all would have that occasion, but we want to know that it's by the Spirit of the Lord, not just people assuming, well, I'm a child of God, because everybody sings that song, I'm a friend of God, but that doesn't make them friends of God, right? So the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And you know one of the ways it does that, he does that, is he causes us to feel some sorrow when we sin, and he causes us to feel some remorse when we're not spending time with our Father because we're children of God, right? And so the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We need to get closer to our Father. It says in verse 17, and if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, also, that we may be also glorified together. So you may say, now we went from having a baby to being heirs. So what happens that we become heirs of something Somebody dies, right? And so let me ask you this, just the same way you'd be preparing for that baby and that child and you would say, here's some of the things I need, I'm gonna go through. Uh, here's some of those prenatal vitamins I need to take uh, to keep my system up. Uh, I need to exercise, I need to walk, I need to have myself prepared because they say if you're in better condition at that point in time, you can handle the birth, uh, birthing quite a bit easier. Uh, so you would prepare yourself like that. So it says here, the spirit who bears witness that we are sons of God, children of God, it says, if, and if children, then heirs. So if you and I, who are believers in Jesus tonight, know that we're heirs of God, we know we have an inheritance coming. Now, how many of you, and I pray that nobody would answer this yes, waited and hoped for your parents to pass so you could have an inheritance. Hopefully we've all been delivered from any kind of mindset like that, but what we're seeing here is we know the Lord has already passed and gone home to be with the Father, so he prepared an inheritance for us. And the Bible says that we're joint heirs with him in what he's going to inherit from the Father. So if we are children of God, we always have something to look forward to. We always have an inheritance. We know that uh, whatever he had, as maybe some of you, if your parents were in business as mine were, or my father was, that when he passed, yes, there was an inheritance, but there was also a lot of responsibility. There were a lot of things we had to do now that we didn't necessarily do before because he did them for us. Even though he was building a business and laying out an inheritance and all these type of things. So one thing about that is, and what we see with the Lord, when you see the Great Commission where he's telling the disciples to go to all the nations because I'm not going to be here, but I will be with you. Uh, he's preparing them and sending them into what he would have done in, say, the family business. This is how you continue the family business. And so we will uh, somewhat be in the same vein because we have an inheritance. We know we're going to receive that inheritance, but there's conditions to what we do to receive what the Lord has given us right? He's already prepared everything. He's got it all set in store. It'd be just like somebody who lays out the will. Uh, they set the stage. They start to bring in managers and different people in the business and say, now listen, here's what I want you to do. My son's going to take over. My daughter's going to run the books. You know, my wife will be the uh, chief officer or the president of the company. And here's a guy that's going to take care of the finances, the CFO, uh, and so on, and starts putting people in positions and places because he knows his time is short. We talked about time being short last week in Revelation chapter 12, right? The devil's 
the devil knew his time was short. And so uh, what did we talk about last week, as a matter of fact? Sunday morning, I mean, it's only four days ago. Buried alive. But what was the scripture? Revelation chapter 12. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. I just thought I'd go back to that, see if you remembered. So, it says, if you and I are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God. In other words, we know God has everything in store for us and join heirs with Christ. Now, a lot of folks will say, well, you know, I'm just here, I'm just doing, I'm just going on and so on and not be mindful of too much of this whatsoever. But, uh, you know, every one of us would like someone to follow us up in what we do. Uh, somebody just asked me a question yesterday about what will happen if something happens to you, which I thought was very on time for what I was reading here and where this was looking like. Because somebody should follow up and somebody should start to say now, well, if so, well, here's what we should be doing and how we should be functioning and what we should be learning. And, you know, the baby's coming, so we better prepare ourselves and start realizing I'm going to get to this place where, I don't know if you ladies remember, you probably can't even remember this kind of stuff, but uh, you probably experienced quite a bit of pain when you were having a baby. I know you don't remember that. Uh, but you knew ahead of time you were going to have pain. You didn't necessarily know how intense it would be. And there might even have been times while that was going on that you said, I don't know if I can do this. Right? right. And we all go through some of those things in some of our daily affairs and preparations for things in life and uh, what we endure in life at times. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can go through this. But what happened? You must have made it through there, right? Yeah. You're still here. Yeah. Children are out there walking around uh, the whole situation. So you see the Lord is able to deliver us Amen. in those type of things. So he says, if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Remember, Christ had a work to finish. So we're joint heirs with him as what the Bible says. So we have a work we need to finish, although we know the Lord has equipped us to do all these things and is bringing us through all these areas. We have people we need to still minister to. We still need to reach. We need to share the gospel with. Uh, we need to fulfill some area of ministry in us. And I'm trying to think this morning, somebody said to me about people who uh, think they have to have a certain ministry and don't understand where they are and what they do on a daily basis may be a big part of what the Lord has ordained for them to do. And that's all true. You know, being effective where you are, sharing where you are, telling people about the love of the Lord, telling them they have an inheritance if they'll come to it. You know, uh, just like anybody else, you may, I, I could have said when we were younger, uh, my brother and I were the only ones in the inheritance of our family business. And so we could have asked my mom to adopt somebody else into the family so they could carry some of the weight and so they could get some of the inheritance. And that's basically what we're doing is saying, come on, you can join our family. Think about that. We don't know you. We don't know what you have gone through, but our Father loves you so much that if you will let him adopt you, you can come and be a part of this inheritance. So it says, if so be that we have suffered or that we suffer with him, that we may also, that we may be also glorified together. Now the suffering part, a lot of the commentary areas take you to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23 through 40 and where it goes through some of the things those men of old suffered and then in verse 40 uh, it tells us that they didn't really receive the promise they had to wait on all of us you remember that uh, maybe I could read it real quick if I have it uh, 
Yeah. 1140, it says, God having provided some better thing for us. That's all of us who are coming to the Lord now. All of the revivals from back in the time of Christ until now, and however long we go on in life here uh, before the Lord returns uh, to put everything in order. However long that is, it says, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, those who suffered in the old covenant as men of God, as prophets and so on, they would, without us, not be made perfect. So the work of everything that was being done from the foundation of the earth couldn't be completed until you and I came along, till the work of the cross, the blood was shed, that blood we talked about Sunday morning, that it's by the blood of the Lamb we overcome. And continue in the faith. It said, all these having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise in verse 39 of Hebrews 11. So, if we're children of God, we're heirs, and if heirs of God, we're joint heirs with Christ, if we suffer with him, it says that we may be also glorified together. And I don't know how you think of this. I don't know if this goes theologically, but it tells us in the scripture that you and I are seated in heavenly places with Christ. Well, where is Christ seated? At the right hand of the Father, the place of glorification. He's glorified there. And so we're going to be glorified together, which means we're going to be seated with him in the glory. And many times we can get lost in some of this uh, as far as why should I keep pushing on? Why should I keep, you know, sharing? Uh, I happened to be in a meeting with some folks last night and one of the ladies was saying to me, and she's into politics and uh, various things, fighting some battles and so on, and she said, you know, after all I've done in all of this, it gets to be pretty wearisome. She had her head down and she said, you know, you think you're going to make a lot of changes and affect a lot of things. And she said, we're trying to do good for people that don't want us to do good for them. And I just saw the sorrow of heart there because so many things are happening and going on. And we're, you know, we're fighting all these battles. And these are folks that go to the state house here in Ohio, present bills, testify, uh, combat a lot of the things, a lot of people would like to put in place that would take away our freedoms and our rights. Now, if we weren't born in America, we would have no right to do a lot of things. But we are here, and we're allowed to use the laws according to what it says. Uh, but if we trust totally in that, there's our sin, there's our error. Then we put our eyes on something else other than the Lord. So in a lot of that, we still need to fight for people uh, just like if you see people being oppressed and you say, well, I'm going to stand up for them who are oppressed. Well, that's honorable in the eyes of the Lord. The only thing now, as I've said so many times, is you've got to make sure scripturally, biblically, you're lined up with the gospel. Because there's so many people out here saying so many things. Remember, I told you, uh, Erwin Lutzer, Dr. Lutzer was in an interview where he said about how the enemy has thrown so many things out to confuse people. And I talked to you about justice systems. And I said that if the justice system they're promulgating doesn't line up with the justice system of this gospel, it's false doctrine. It's the spirit of antichrist. If you say I have rights, uh, even though the Bible says, well, you're not allowed to use those rights, then you violate the gospel. OK, now you could say, well, the court says to me that even though these people are Christians or that's a church, the court said I have a right to sue them. Your Bible says you don't. Right. He says, what are you doing taking your brother to court uh, in front of judges and people of the land when you should be able to settle those matters of, between yourself? Why don't you just dismiss all of that? And so you violate 
the truth of the gospel with a right that they say that you have out here. And if we were put under certain religious systems which exist in the world today that say you men are allowed to beat your wife into submission, and so you say, well, now it's the law. I can beat my wife into submission. Your Bible tells you that sin against your wife, against your own body, because you become one, and against the Lord. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. right. So, you and I are joint heirs with the Lord. So if you're an heir with somebody, it means you start preparing things, just like I said about having the baby. Uh, what do I need to know if I have to run this business? What do I have to uh, know if I have to deal with these customers or these people? And it's the same thing here in everything that the Lord has for us. So I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, and everybody, listen, you all feel like you're suffering through things. And many of us are. There's no doubt about it. But if we will endure these sufferings, and here's the other thing, too, is not always look at it as an oppression, but, Lord, what should I be learning from this? How should I go through this? What should I keep my eyes on so that I don't focus on just what's troubling and what's bothersome and what may be looking like it's an oppressor? What can I see in all this? And I don't want to be mystical. I want to be where you want me in this in a right way. So the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's go back to having the baby. Because even though you thought, you know, you were ready at a moment there to pick up the bedpan and smack your husband with it for <laughs> looking at you wrong or don't you understand what I'm going through and so on. When the baby came, there was such a awe that it didn't matter what happened prior to that. And yes, there may even have been some physical complications and you may have felt that for a while and so on, but in the end of it all, the baby's so much worth it. And here's what we're looking at here, the glory that is set before us, the glory that was set before Jesus, as the Bible says, he was able to endure all that he went through on our behalf because he knew was, he was bringing all the saints to glory. He knew he was finishing the work. He knew he was putting death and hell away once and for all, and our sin away once and for all. Yep. He knew he was condemning sin in the flesh so that we could have liberty and freedom. So, the glory that's before us, which will be revealed, and you know, when we see Jesus, if we're in, in the grave and he calls us up, if we're on the earth here walking around and we see him in the clouds when he gives the shout, the glory of all of that, we're not going to remember any of this other stuff. It's going to be just like having the baby. It's going to be like that's over and done. That's behind us. Look what we got now. And there's the Lord and our salvation completed. The earnest expectation of the creature, it says, waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. All creation has been waiting for you and I, along with all the saints, and everybody from the time of Jesus' death on the cross till the end of all of this to be fulfilled, for all of us to be that fulfillment, it says creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation, which was groaning and reeling and travailing and will continue to do until we are all made whole and perfected, which means we're with the Lord, the earth and creation knows then everything's going to be set back in right order. So as you and I are praying and waiting for somebody to come to the Lord, know that the earth, the animal kingdom, all these things have been waiting for the time when you and I are made perfect because it knows, they know, everything is going to be set in order. 
So it waited for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of the hope, or by the reason of him who has subjected him, or subjected the same in hope. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. In other words, the Lord has allowed all this to happen because of the hope that he has, which is his faith, that we're going to come through all this. And the earth is going to be restored. And everything is going to be set back in place. And this is the blessing of the Lord. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. We didn't say, listen, we want to have corruption. We didn't say, listen, we want to have sin. We didn't say, listen, we want to have actual vanity where we're arrogant and haughty and all that kind of stuff. He says we were made subject to all of this. So that what it says here, his hope, his faith could be manifest. Look what I've done. Again, you take what the Bible says about the foolish of the earth and the unwise and how God would use them, whoever they are out there, to show forth his glory. So that you and I, he can make us look like we're the wise. In fact, I'll read a scripture or two here that goes out of Ecclesiastes real quick. So the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. <clears throat> that means the animal kingdom, the earth, all of us, there'll be no more corruption. Shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know, it was pretty gloomy looking outside for a while today, but if you can always remember, you know what? The sun is shining. There is light on the other side of this. You can look at your situations in life like storm clouds and listen, they're going to pass. There's still, the sun is still out there. There's still heat in the air and so on. And this will blow by. It will end. How many of you saw the lightning last night? A lot of people were even taking pictures of it. I was on my way up to the Cleveland area and I've never seen, I told my wife this, she thought it was funny. I've never seen such fat lightning bolts. Normally it's a streak shooting across the sky. You know, you see this was like these big tree things turned upside down or looked like a, a trunk of a tree and then branching off in different areas and so on. Lots of them. And then on my way back, it was darker out and they were now they were up in the Cleveland area, not on the way up there, and they were still those great big things and it, with the dark uh, sky behind them, it was like awesome watching it. I wouldn't really want to keep driving in it, but it was awesome to see. So it says in 21, the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. In other words, the earth is going to be purified. The animal kingdom is going to be set right. We know it talks about a time you're not going to have animals ravaging one another. They'll be right by each other as it was in the garden. Um, free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation, in verse 22, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So, we are children of God. We're heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ in uh, Romans 8, 17. So let's go to Romans, or excuse me, Hebrews 9, 15. Because if you remember there, it talks about what the mediator of the testament is. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Um, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament... So he's going to redeem the transgressions of the First Testament 
they which are called might receive the promise of inter eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. Now, in the world, there's also back there in Psalm 49, I don't think I wrote it down. You've heard me say Psalm 49 a couple times later. <clears throat> He's talking about the inner eternal inheritance here. In Psalm 49, it talks about um, the redemption of the soul and how a man believes that he will live forever and not see corruption in verse 9 of chapter 49. In verse 10 of 49, it says, For he seeth uh, that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. An inheritance. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. Right? And so you think, well, I give my sons the business, they'll keep it forever. They get the business, they realize they don't want to work like that, they put it up for sale, they get a buyer, they take the cash, they're all living in Florida now on the beach. They took the money and bought a yacht so they can enjoy life. Listen to what it says. He seeth that wise men die, likewise the foolish and the brutish person perish. So he sees that everybody dies. And they leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought. Now they may not say this outwardly to everybody, but their inward thought is, uh, my kids are going to take this, they're going to run for this, this will be theirs for the rest of their lives, and they'll pass it on to the grandkids. <clears throat> their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. That means their family generations. They call their lands after their own names. Now, you know out here there's a lot of these streets, you may not know exactly, but these are all named after families in various areas. And there's plots of property that are uh, named after the family. And that's exactly what it's saying here. They're hoping that their inheritance that they're passing will last forever in that realm. But Jesus tells us our inheritance is forever. It is eternal. The work that he does will continue eternally. And what you and I inherit, we're going to be there forever. We're going to inherit a house, right? He calls it a mansion in John 14. And it's there for us forever. I hope you do what uh, there, what I said one time down at the park when we had a function going on. We were all under the tent. And I said, hey, everybody, I didn't put the tent up for you all just to hang out in here. I don't know in the kingdom. I don't think we're going to just hang out in our houses in our mansions and I'm sure there's not going to be cable TV there so we'll all be free and you'll be allowed to think biblically and scripturally because that won't be messing with your mind think about that his inheritance is forever so for this cause it says back there in Hebrews chapter 9 <clears throat> He is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, he knew he had to die, just like none of us could receive an inheritance uh, from our families unless our fathers or mothers and so on passed. By means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. In other words, his house is going to last forever. And the lands he puts his name on are going to be for eternity. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. And so we know Jesus was the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the fulfillment of the new covenant, the new testament. So to enact a testament, he had to die so he could be the testator 
of a new covenant, of a new testament, where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Why did Jesus have to die, people say? If God was so good, if God was so loving, why did he have to die? Here's our answer. We couldn't have a new testament, a new covenant, an inheritance, be joint heirs with, unless he died. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Now, I can tell you this also. My father wrote a note and put it in a file for a piece of property that he had to tell us what to do with that piece of property and who to contact and who owed money for it and various things. That wasn't part of his will or his testament. But that was like a side note. Now, we could not have enforced that because it was not part of the testament, a part of the will. It wasn't signed and witnessed because every will is, has to have a signature and witnesses. So Jesus witnesses, we see hundreds of them in the scriptures. Those who saw him rise from the dead, those who were there with him when he died or observed his death on the cross. Uh, all these are testators and witnesses of what he did for us. So that note that was a side note would be like somebody else just throwing somebody out here, something out here to us and saying, you should believe this. Well, listen, if it's not in the will, it may be a little part of something, but the will is what we go by. In every court and every attorney would say the same thing. A testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is, is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Why is it of no strength? Because at any time, he may have said, here's what I want to go to these two sons of mine. But let's say one of the sons dies in a car accident. The father is still alive, so that's changed. Uh, let's say... Uh, the father decides at one point in time I was going to do this all with them, but now I want to include an organization and give to this work out here or something else so he can go in and change it. So it's not of effect until afterward. A testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator live or liveth. So again, why Jesus had to die? What did they say? We heard Messiah lives forever, right? That was why they said, well, how can you be the Messiah? We heard he lives forever and you're telling us you're gonna die. Well, the will can't be put in effect unless he does die. They didn't know that he was gonna rise from the dead and be alive forevermore, okay? Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Or neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Yeah, I read that right. So he's going to tell us how the first testament was put in place by blood uh, because it requires blood and someone had to die. Uh, in verse 19, it says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. So there was a death and there was the shedding of blood, just like we talked about by the blood of the lamb. We uh, overcame in Revelation chapter, is it 12, 11, I think, uh, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Testimony, testament, will, the written word, all those things correlate. So when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, in other words, what's he doing here? He's reading the will to the people. He's saying, this is what the Lord has said. Just like you go to the attorney's office and they open the will and they read to you, here's what your parents left you, here's what your uncle left you, here's what it says in here. Oh wait, there's a requirement 
Uh, you may see this in some of the movies. It's always a funny thing. They have to go live in the house for a while. And they go to the house and it's a shambles and they say, what is this? And then they find out it's worth tons of money because it happens to be in this specific area or you know, there's some catch to it all. So for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no rolling away of sin or error or deception or any of these things. 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Now there are folks today that say that there was never a requirement for a blood sacrifice. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary in verse 23 that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these things. And there's a lot of question about this. Do you mean the things in heaven were defiled, so on? Well, remember, there was rebellion in heaven. Lucifer and his angels. So very possible that's what it refers to. Um, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Amen. Why did he have to die? Because he had to appear in the presence of God for us. Yep. And that was the only way. Why did he have to shed blood? Because almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission or rolling away of sin. How do we overcome? And nobody... You know, I won't say nobody, forgive me for putting that there. Some people don't want to say, talk about the blood. They don't want to say how valuable it is the blood was shed for us. Uh, Jesus didn't really have to die. You saw that in some of the progressive church videos we showed here. That they have now come, we're wiser than that, and so on. Amen? I'll talk a little bit, not now, but uh, maybe next Wednesday night or maybe even Sunday. Just some areas of Genesis, when we read what really happened, no, I'm not even going to say that right now. I'll just, we'll go to Genesis, we'll go to what it says there in some areas, and it's like, when you look at it, I hope I'm seeing this all correctly, because it seems so simple now to understand, well, here's what's going on. And I'll relate it to what's happening right now, and a lot of things that you're hearing and seeing, and some of you have experienced some of them, and you wonder why, and it's back there in Genesis. We'll talk about it. So let's see. Um, got all of that. The witnesses we talked about, the heirs, uh, knowing what's left to them, uh, the inward thought of those who left things in the earth, and then Christ knowing that his inheritance with us is eternal, uh, there's things you have to do. There has to be a transfer. You know, a lot of things are in somebody's name, right? You ever deal with transferring a deed for property or uh, maybe the car title, you know? You might be the executor of the state, so you have to sign for everything because everything has to transfer over to somebody or someplace. 
right? What did Jesus do with the Great Commission? He transferred power to the disciples so that they could go on his behalf and act as the executors of his estate, the kingdom that he went away to receive, that he's coming back to set up you and I and in those disciples is the authority. He said, in my name, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. He said, go in my name to all the nations of the world, preach the gospel. He was transferring power, yep. just like you have to go transfer the deeds. You have to transfer the car titles. You may have to transfer stocks and bonds or um, what do you call them, uh, condo situations, uh, all that kind of stuff to transfer them. So you're giving those people now the power to do with that as they please. So you want to pray for anybody you're thinking to leave anything to. If you're thinking your inward thought is they'll keep it forever, you need to put something in there that says you have to keep it this long. Uh, you know, when you buy a business sometimes, uh, let's say you have a business that's been well known in the area and it's got its recipes all set that nobody else has. And that's what the business is known for. Now, when we bought a food business, we didn't have to do this, but those folks were there with us all the time to make sure we didn't change the recipes. The reason being, you change the recipes, you may lose customers. So in a lot of business dealings, when you buy a business like that, it says right in there, you are not allowed to change the recipes. You have to keep them the same because the clientele is gonna keep coming and expecting that. And here's the deal we're making with you, but that's part of the agreement. Because as soon as people start changing recipes, and we experienced that ourselves when we put some people in the place we had, Two weeks later, they decided this is too hard. Wait a minute, you have employees. My wife and I were doing this all by ourselves for the last couple years there. Before that, we had one of our daughters with us. You got employees and they're telling you it's too hard to do what we were doing, which we thought we didn't even know how to work. Anyway, something that seemed like the biggest burden of our lives became a great blessing because it changed how we do certain things and look at certain things. Anyway, your inheritance and our inheritance in Christ. Yeah. He talks about eternal, eternal blessings, eternal health and well-being and you know freedom from all these things. And I know we can't really get a handle on all of that, but that's what he talks about. So if you're nine months pregnant, and you're getting ready to have the baby, don't you dare turn to your husband and say, honey, what's going on? Why am I feeling this? I even wrote down, how often did he have to remind you that you're pregnant? You can't get close to the counter anymore when you want to eat. You're always running to the restroom. You feel drained. Uh, you know, then everything else that goes with all that, the morning sickness, all those things, nobody had to remind you that was what it was about, right? You didn't have to keep getting out one of those little sticks and testing to see if you're pregnant. You knew everything was changing and adjusting, getting ready for what was going to happen. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. John the Baptist, remember? We're going to sing the song here when we take some time to praise. Um, anyhow, prepare mentally for what's going on. Prepare physically like you would have. I got to keep telling myself about three more months. I'm going to be having this baby. I'm going to be in the hospital. It's going to be tough. I, you know, I'm going to have to keep myself and so on. You know, do the exercises you need to do, the repetitious things, the two who, who's and a he or the two he's and a ha, whatever it is, all that kind of stuff. If people even do that anymore. Uh, nowadays, I'm not going to say that. I'll tell you all afterwards. I just had a thought. It's going to be funny. You'll laugh. Anyway, Ecclesiastes, let me do these two scriptures. It's 20 till 8. We're great on time, but Ecclesiastes. Remember Solomon and all of his writings? 
Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5. And this is telling us a little bit about the law of the land, if you have a king and so on. But it's pretty interesting. It says in verse 5 of chapter 8, Whoso keepeth the commandment, now these are referring actually to the commandments of the king. Remember, Solomon was the king. Shall feel no evil thing. Now, if you have a just ruler, which the Bible talks about, you hear me say it over and over again, and a ruler who fears God, he's saying, if you just keep the commandment of what we're putting out here to do, you'll feel no evil thing. If you have a king or a leader with no corruption, that's going to be a blessing. All you have to do is live accordingly is what he's saying. It says, In a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Wait a minute. I've got seven more days before the baby comes. I shouldn't be having any pains. My stomach, I shouldn't look bigger. I shouldn't feel bloated. I shouldn't not be able to keep all these things down when I eat them. I still have seven days. He says, No, a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. In other words, when Jesus told us in Matthew 24 there and in Luke, all these things are going to come to pass, so we realize, gosh, I'm starting to put on a little bit of weight. I'm starting to feel a little bit bloated. I'm having a hard time when I eat, you know, keeping the food down and so on. We can discern the time. We can discern and judge what's going on. He says, because to every purpose there is a time and judgment. And what did we talk about Sunday morning? Now is the judgment of this world in John 4. Uh, he was set in the earth, as it says in the scripture, for judgment. Uh, so it says, because to every purpose there is a time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. And he's talking about what we know and what we see going on, the time, the judgment. It's like a misery. And so I want you to understand tonight, if you're feeling some of that, don't get down on yourself. Don't, you know, I mean, don't go into a depression, but realize men of old, there's nothing new under the sun. That's in Ecclesiastes also, right? There's a season for everything, a time for this and a time for that, a time for building, a time for tearing down. Our city is in a time of tearing down. Uh, anything they can get their hands on or a backhoe on. Um, make sure you don't leave anything out in the open. Uh, it may be torn down. Uh, don't go away for too long. Anyway. Because to every purpose there is a time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be. Now we're talking about those out there that don't know scriptural things and the times and seasons the Lord has warned us of. He knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? Shouldn't you and I be able to tell him when it's going to be? And so listen, don't get caught up in their, their things out there in the world. We don't know when this is going to happen and what's going on. And so we get into, into the throngs of the conversation with them as though, yeah, this is just horrible. Yeah, this is just terrible. Uh, I don't know. Nobody can do anything about it. No, he says we, we should know, be able to tell him when it shall be. Well, listen, yes, these things are for a time and season. But one day Jesus is going to come. The earth is going to rejoice that the sons of God are manifest. And corruption is going to be dealt with and all things are going to be put back in order. Listen, they're telling you that if you go out on the mountain and do a mantra, you're going to beautify the earth. No, that's not what's going to happen. That if you just uh, don't start your lawnmower and don't run your car when you're not in it and going somewhere that everything's going to go. No, that's not what the Bible says. The truth of it. In Ecclesiastes 117. 
Solomon had said, he had talked about a few things, but he said, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of, of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief. And listen, at, when I'm going through all this and reading this in the last couple of days and so on, when this lady sat with me last night and explained to me what she's feeling, that's exactly what this is. Wisdom on how to help people, wisdom how to help pull them up in a right godly way Yet nobody wants to listen because there's other elements involved. And so he says, for in much wisdom is much grief. She's grieved. And so are lots of people, lots of people in our government up here and so on, in the areas of cities and states and, you know, burgs and, and D.C. They're, they're grieved because they have the wisdom of what's going on. They know what's happening. They know what it takes to make things turn around, but it's like nobody's listening, as though there's some evil in the land. For in much wisdom is much grief. So if you feel grieved about some of the things that you're seeing, don't despair. Yeah. It's not new in the earth. And you know the Bible says there's no temptation. You may be tempted to just throw up your hands. I said that one time to somebody, do you ever feel like just throwing up your hands? And they said, no, but I feel like throwing up because of what I'm seeing. Yeah. So it's not new to you or to me. It's not a new thing that never happened. The men of old that we read about, they all saw these kind of things and dealt with those kind of things. And some of them felt the oppression of it all. But the Lord was with them. And many of them never saw things turn around. Today we got this happy-go-lucky attitude. Well, we prayed yesterday, so everything's going to turn around. Really? The Bible doesn't tell us that. Yes, we can ask according to his will. But what if what you're saying today is not his will for this time that we're in? You're saying, let's build up, let's build up. And in Ecclesiastes, it tells us that God is saying, I'm going to tear down, I'm going to tear down. So you're actually working against the Lord, against his will. And we don't want to be in that place. Uh, you may say, you've heard me say this so many times about somebody having prosperity. And I said to somebody here recently, listen, I would rather you lose everything you have and walk with the Lord. Because whatever you lose, God will give back to you anyway. In one form or another, you may never see it in this type of stuff. But the joy that you'll have, the peace that you'll have, the assurance of salvation, that's worth far more than what you can ever muster up on that job you're working. Yeah. All right? I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is a vexation of spirit. In other words, it, it's heaviness on your spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. The more we know, the more truth we allow to abound in us. And somebody says to you, well, you should smile all the time and be happy. Where are they? Do they understand the dilemmas of things that are going on here? And like we talked about just briefly last week, the day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloom, it says in the scripture. And we should not desire the woeful day. We should desire the day of salvation when many who've been turned around are going to meet the Lord face to face in all of this. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, I thank you for the word tonight. Just ask your blessing wherever you just planted some seeds, wherever you stirred some things. Father, wherever you caused a spark of light, I thank you for it right now, and I believe you for it. And we give you praise and glory and honor. And Father, we want to walk in all this. We know we have an inheritance. We know Jesus is the testator. We know that, as it said here, knowledge brings sorrow. Uh, Father, sometimes in our own lives, what we know now makes us sorrowful about what we did before. But we thank you that, as Paul said, I leave those things which are behind and I press on toward the mark. And Father, forgiven ourselves as we ask you to forgive us. And Lord, not letting the enemy gain ground, 
Uh, we thank you for that this night. We give you all the praise and glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.